Support for Higher Education in Focus comes from the Penn State Alumni Association, serving alumni and alma mater for 145 years. On the web at alumni.psu.edu. Penn State Bookstore, improving the student experience at Penn State with philanthropic support of student causes throughout the university. On the Hub Lawn or at psu.bncollege.com. The attorneys of McNeese, Wallace, and Nurek. Your mission, your goal, your lawyers. More at mwn.com. And from viewers like you, thank you. Welcome to Higher Education in Focus. I'm Patty Satalia with my co-host, Penn State President Dr. Eric Barron. Joining us in the studio is Penn State's new athletic director, Sandy Barber. She's the first woman to hold the position at the university. Before coming to Penn State, she spent 10 years as AD at the University of California at Berkeley. She has also served as the assistant athletic director at Notre Dame and at Tulane. She coached field hockey at Northwestern and competed in field hockey and basketball as a student at Wake Forest. Forest. At Penn State, Barber will oversee 31 varsity sports and more than 800 athletes. We'll talk about the job, about the lifting of some NCAA sanctions, and about her thoughts on potential changes to NCAA regulations. Thank you so much for joining us. Let's start by talking about what's on the lips of every Penn State fan, and that's the fact that uh, a number of sanctions have been lifted, the best news Penn State has had in two years. What does this mean for the athletic department and to Penn State as a whole? Well, I, I think it's it's actually for the entire university um, because this has been uh, this is this has been about the university. It's been about Penn State and the seriousness uh, with which uh, the university has addressed the issues, uh, the uh, cooperation that the university has presented with with all authorities involved, and uh, ultimately from an athletics perspective. I'm really pleased for the young men in our football program that they have the opportunity uh, to go after uh, bowl eligibility, as uh, as we've said a number of times since the sanctions were lifted. We're now eligible to become eligible. Uh, there's a lot of work still still to be done, uh, but I, I think uh, the the overall signal is about progress uh, and about seriousness uh, and about cooperation. And of course, the full. Uh, complement of football scholarships will be renewed in 2015-2016. So in my view this is um, is very significant. First of all the reductions are entirely focused on our students and student athletes and and that that's incredibly significant. Um, these are students that had nothing to do with 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 what occurred. So um, to have them be able to have more students to have scholarships and to be able to compete, that, that's, um, that's a wonderful statement, I think. And I also sort of imagine that here you are a senior and you stuck with Penn State and said a degree from Penn State is really what I'm after and I'm also great at football and I'm going to stay here and I'm going to know that for a while the students that are coming behind me on my team have come here not with as many scholarships and not eligible for a bowl and now those students with that attitude get rewarded because they can compete and and achieve that bowl if they earn it. How disappointed are you that uh, not included in the rollback of sanctions was the sixty million dollar penalty that was levied against Pennsylvania although the good news is that that sixty million dollars can now be spent for programs in Pennsylvania. Yeah, um, I'm, I must admit, on a personal level, the the um, the money is the least significant issue. Um, I'm very proud of the fact that that expenditure of funds fits entirely with what the university has been doing to actually promote programming and hiring faculty and and to tackle. Uh, uh, abuse issues a, as a scholarly um, activity and and have those funds be spent in Pennsylvania that's what we expected and um, and I hope that it it does great things to help a lot of children that need help. 
Writing in Penn Live, journalist David Jones uh, says that between the hiring of James Franklin as the football coach and you as the first woman uh, AD uh, at Penn State, Penn State is, quote, busting its old molds. So I I'm wondering, for those more comfortable with the status quo, why, Sandy Barber, are you the right person for this job? Well, I, I believe it's about fit and it's about values, uh, regardless of the package uh, that we come in. Uh, I've always admired Penn State. I grew up as a, as a Marylander. Yes, I've been all over the country now and on some occasions all over the world, but uh, grew up in East Coaster, always admired Penn State, not only athletically. You but were a Navy brat, right? Your father was I, in the Navy, I, so you I, you I am a Navy Europe. brat, <laughs> always will be a Navy brat, uh, but always admired Penn State uh, for, for what it represented educationally and then the opportunity to combine that with a really high quality intercollegiate athletic program and uh, doing it the right way, which I believe Penn State always has done. Uh, and I wanted to be a part of that. And I believe that I bring experience and leadership capabilities uh, to help Penn State do what it's done really well, even bigger and better. When you chose your uh, athletic director at Florida State University, you said you knew the moment you met him that he was the right person, the right mm -hmm. fit for the job. So I'm wondering what makes for an ideal athletic director? Yeah, so there, I, I've actually formed really strong opinions on, on the topic. First of all, I, I love the idea that an athletic director was a student athlete and cared about academics and competed and so they understand it from a student perspective and also how to excel as a student. I, I love the fact that the AD sat there and said, okay, I've come out of my undergraduate degree, but this isn't enough for me to do a really good job. I'm gonna go get an advanced degree. I might go get an advanced degree in some field of management or an MBA because there's a business involved now in athletic, you know, Sandy, Sandy um, scored twice on, on, on that attribute. I love the fact that the individuals experience things from a coach. They and she was a coach. And she was a coach. <laughs> she, she, you nego you've negotiated for your own contract. You know exactly what it is. You have seen leaders that you have followed and realized how, um, how you would like to treat someone as an AD. And then to climb the ladder as an AD. Because this day and age, experiences at different institutions are worth a lot. So to see this at Tulane, to be hiring a head coach, to watch them succeed, to have to compete, to do it at Notre Dame, do it at Notre Dame under, under the tutelage of a, a really very fine in, individual, to take the entire show on yourself, this is a set of experience which means that you face these problems of scheduling and of contracts. And, and finally, to be part of the national stage. So, so that not only are you doing a good job internally, but externally, your colleagues appreciate the fact that you're part of the conversation on the direction of athletics. So you sit on national committees. I think it's worth saying, and, and so I, I, I can almost feel your passion yep. for sports, but sports at colleges and universities is often the part that university presidents like the least. And you've said before, athletics represent 10% of the budget, but way more than 10% of a university president's time. So, you know, on the one hand, I love it. I'm a fan. Um, I marvel at the fact that in the president's box here, everybody is watching the game. And instead of talking? Or instead of talking. And, you know, that, that really pleases me, and I get caught up in it and, uh, and excited about it. Um, and where does the 10% of the, the magnified sense of time come from? Well, it comes from the fact that it's so incredibly visible. And that means it's so incredibly important that you do it right. It's so important that the institution is, is uh, in control, that you're paying attention to the student part of the athlete, that you're operating with integrity. And these are things that Penn State does really well. And so, um, you know, I don't know how you feel about those particular points there and how your experience has contributed to, to your vision, but um, that's why it becomes so important. It is so visible. It's such a great opportunity because of the passion that, yep. it, that exists. Yep. Uh, it's such a great opportunity for intercollegiate athletics to serve as, you hear it all the time, the front porch 
uh, for for the university. Uh, and there, there are two impacts. One is on those 800 plus student athletes and their Penn State experience. And then by extension through them, the 600,000 living alumni, the student uh, body, the current student body base, all have an opportunity to connect to Penn State through intercollegiate athletics, which puts a premium on us doing it the right way, having intercollegiate athletics uh, represent all of the right values that represent Penn State. Speaking of the right uh, values, one of the things that gets uh, uh, less attention when we when we start talking about rankings in col college sports is the graduation rate for athletes. The graduation rate uh, at Florida State University and uh, at the University of California at Berkeley were, were much lower than at Penn State. But both of you have committed to making Penn State's 90% graduation rate among students even higher. So how do you do that, Sandy Barber? Well, I, I will tell you this uh, about Berkeley. Uh, we, were, we were very good relative to the overall Berkeley student body. Uh, and then we had a problem in football. And uh, I told the committee this, and I told Dr. Barron this in the interview process, that uh, shortcoming uh, actually was an experience that will make me better. Uh, I, I said at the time, my next stop will benefit from, from that experience. Penn State's always done very, very well, uh, particularly in the graduation rate and the academic metrics of their football program, certainly overall athletically. Uh, the resources are here, the, uh, the focus is here, and uh, it will be my job to to make sure as the leader of athletics and then in conjunction with Eric as the leader of this university uh, to make sure we keep our eye on that ball and never that it never leaves our consciousness for one moment and that's really the key because then the coaches get the message you hire the right coaches the coaches get the message they go out and they recruit the right young people uh, and we bring them into a system that accepts nothing other than academic success and I you know I think this is a a really interesting topic to analyze really because um, at Penn State this is part of Penn State and you really see I believe Paterno's contribution to this particular topic. When I was a faculty member and teaching at Penn State I used to have a lot of student athletes that were in my class, scholarship athletes and football um, uh, players and I'd get a form to fill out um, attendance, quizzes, exam scores, how this person is doing. Well, if you check the box they missed a quiz or didn't turn in a homework, that player... Someone paid attention to no, it. That player was in my office the next day and it was, Dr. Barron, I'm sorry, that will never happen again. Okay, now that tells me that the coaching staff was signaling to that player, you want to play? You want to be a part of this squad? I expect you to excel in the classroom. And you watch a lot of other times, and I heard, heard this said, when we're good, we won't have to recruit knuckleheads. Okay, so in my mind, this is the suggestion that, okay, if, if I really want to have this team, I may change my attitude in order to bring this player in. And I think we have an attitude here that we, we want to recruit kids that are smart and, and not making exceptions and for students and, just and have a not good sit there and say you know I, I know I know that person is not going to be successful in this academic program but I need him okay I believe that if you have that attitude um, then you're in trouble so in my view that means I have to stand tall on this topic you have to stand tall on this topic but nothing is more important than a coach that has that attitude and so if James Franklin puts an away jersey and a home jersey and a graduation gown on the wall, then we're starting with that signal from the beginning. And what we're doing is maintaining a powerful tradition at this institution that students are important. Well, speaking of students, uh, although it's not a done deal yet, the NCA uh, has approved uh, autonomy, mm -hmm. which could allow Penn State to, to change, to create new rules for student athletes. What will that mean, Sandy, to Penn State? Well, it will start with the conference. 
Uh, so, so the autonomy is for what have been referred to as the Power Five conferences, of which the Big Ten certainly plays a very prominent role. And I believe that there are things like full cost of attendance scholarships that to be fair and right to our student athletes, we need to be allowed uh, as an athletic conference and as a university to provide them with a scholarship that's full cost of attendance. They others can, others uh, on the campus. Enough money so that they can eat, so they can... Well, uh, it's, the scholarship has always include tuition fees, room, board, and use of books. But there's there's a federal financial aid term called cost of attendance that is the other things that, you know, transportation to and from home. Um, some of the other things that uh, kind of miscellaneous expenses, supplies, right. a little bit of spending money yeah. that are not included in that. And that others on all of our college campuses have had access to. So, so that's something that I think is, is really, really necessary. There are a few things around health and welfare for students, for student athletes that are really necessary. But I, I would caution us, and Eric and I have talked about this, that once we get through those very, I think, very basic uh, principles around health and welfare and educational opportunity for students, we need to be very careful as, a, as an enterprise intercollegiate athletics as an enterprise then to have the discipline not to use that autonomy. I, I think it's an interesting point because I think actually by, by having a power five and a more limited set of presidents that govern similar programs, we've just been challenged to look each other in the eye and say we can all come together to have the student come first. And as opposed to um, the authority now to get carried away and you know, run out ahead and, and make it look like a business, I think instead that the challenge is look each other in the eye, we're going to do this the right way. But there are some who say that this professional model is a bit of a slippery slope. For instance, what could be negotiated is providing uh, money to families of poor athletes whose whose families can't make it to a bowl game, for example. Things that are going to increase significantly, perhaps, the cost per athlete. And so the number of scholarships may be limited, especially at a smaller school than Penn State. Well, and I think this is part of the reason why the Big Ten has come up with a platform, because the presidents are trying to signal that um, that what we're focusing is on the student athlete. So what I'd flip this a little bit and tell you that if all these tools become recruiting tools to be able to market a, an image and offer something, oh, by the way, at the I local the X point. dealer, um, and we're going to do this for your family and we're going to do this, then I think you're, you're running down that particular road and you're moving to recruit people into your institution as opposed to sitting there and saying, you're coming in the door, and I think the ben Big Ten prefers not to have freshman eligibility, you're coming in the door, and now once you're in this door, we're going to take good care of you. I think that's really where that slippery slope occurs, is if this becomes a major focus on, on recruiting. Do you, do you feel that that's I, the absolutely. issue? Absolutely, and I think that's a, that's a really good, uh, reasonable, and common sense line to, to draw. So for instance, your example, uh, if, it, if it is in the best interest of what I call conditions for success, conditions for educational and athletic success for a student athlete, if it's in the, their, their best interest uh, for those conditions to pay for their family to attend a bowl game, then the answer should be yes to that. If it's about recruiting them, uh, and this is what the, this is what we need to offer to to get them to come to our institution. I think the answer should be no. I, I think that's a great line to draw. It is. And on that note, we, we need to leave it there. Thank you so much to Sandy Barber, Penn State's new athletic director. In just a moment, I'll talk one on one with President Barron about how critical athletics are to successful fundraising, about one ranking that gets relatively little attention and about the favorite part of his new job so far. We'll be right back. You consider sports a springboard, a bridge to reaching other goals for Penn State. So with that in mind, I, I'm going to switch gears a little bit and ask you about what you're anticipating in terms of state appropriations to Penn State in the coming year. 
Yeah, we're going to do something very different. Um, year after year, we've gone and said, you know, please give us you know, five percent, whatever uh, increase in our budget, um, and in doing so, uh, we will charge the less to the students than we would we would have. And I think at least from the time period of the recession, we haven't been successful in in, in attracting those funds. And the university turns around and raises tuition in an amount and continues to prosper and do good things and um, become ever more powerful and prominent in the world of higher education. So you can sort of imagine a legislature going, okay. They're they, doing fine without they're us. They're doing fine. They asked us for a round number and, you know, if we don't give them the round number, they still seem to do well. So what I would like to do is go to the state and say, we would like to be your partner in economic development in the state of Pennsylvania. Which you are anyway. We are, but there's a, there's a difference. What we describe ourselves are as, a, as here's our economic impact, $16 billion a year. But what I would like to say is here's how we can be a true economic driver. And here's how we can get our intellectual property to the marketplace even better. So, for example, right now we're 18th in the total amount of research funding that we have. In the country. In the country. All universities, public and private. We're 62 in licensing our intellectual property. Okay, so... Wow, so work with the state to license some of change, what's happening let's here. Let's change this. Let's create a cultural change. Let's um, create much more opportunity for faculty and students to be entrepreneurial. So I want to go to the state and say, okay, I'm going to fund these parts. Would you fund these elements to help us hire additional faculty, to focus on our, our office that helps promote um, transfer of, of intellectual property? And together, we're going to launch something really substantial and make a big difference in the, in the state of Pennsylvania. That's a specific request, a specific dollar amount that you can actually count up the budget element rather than just having our hand out. And Hopefully, they'll look at that and say, well, not only is this different, but the state really wants to promote economic development. Let's, let's do this experiment with Penn State and give them money and see what they do. You know, in, in follow-up to what you're saying, Penn State's For the Future capital campaign yeah. ended just a few months ago at over $2 billion. Amazing. Now, university presidents, uh, by and large, consider the fundraising aspect of their job a chore. You've said you don't, uh, but what I'm wondering is, what impact does football have on successful fundraising, and, and, and where okay. does that... So, you know, there is one perspective here, which is reconnect with your alumni. Um, if you bring them back to campus, they're reminded of the fact that their experience here was transformative. And because it was transformative and they realize that this is a place where their lives changed, then they go, yes, and, and I have the capability to give back. So part of that notion of sports is it's a number one way in which an alum comes back and remembers how transformative the experience was. Speaking of expenditures, there were, were some decisions that were made prior to your uh, coming to Penn State and, and prior to Sandy Barber's coming to Penn State. I'm talking about expenditures like a, a multi-million dollar uh, new scoreboard and iPads for student athletes. On the other hand, uh, there was the elimination of the tailgate, which has been widely criticized. So I'm wondering, what will go into decision makings about expenditures and cuts when it comes to athletics in the future? Okay, so um, there is no doubt that this is one of the reasons why you hire an AD, so she can balance all of those different elements. I don't know of any sports who don't have elements that are things that they need and want. There is no doubt that because of the expenditures that have occurred associated with the um, uh, with the sanctions that the amount of money that's gone into capital projects and athletics is probably the place where it was hurt the most. We've maintained all the sports, we've maintained all of our programs with, 31. with athletes and we intend to continue to do that but capital projects change. So what you're looking at is a priority list and we pay attention to coaches priority lists.
And you get lots of advice from lots of people. You do. How do you sort out what advice you take and how you'll, you'll make okay, your decisions so ultimately? I really love advice. I mean, it's just so much better to have too much of it than, than to not have enough. And it gives you a chance to weigh different perspectives and to think about what it is that people are, are, are concerned about. And it gives you the opportunity to, um, to, to move forward. But you have to realize, okay, I have to, I have to, to make the decision and I have to above all else do the right thing. The reason why a president has a contract is so they feel the freedom to do the right thing and what's best mm -hmm. for, the, for the university. So I'm, I'm going to continue in that mode and get as much advice as I can and go step by step. The Penn State laureate last year asked his class what they were looking for in the new Penn State president and they said, don't hire a workaholic. Yeah. They don't have time to reflect and ponder the larger picture or the nuanced implications of events. So in just a couple of words, what does that mean to you? That means our students are very wise. <laughs> and on that note, we are out of time. Thanks so much for talking with us. That's our first episode of Higher Education in Focus. Thank you so much to our guest, Penn State's Athletic Director, Sandy Barber, with Penn State President, Dr. Eric Barron. I'm Patty Satalia. For all of us here at Penn State Public Media, thanks for joining us. Support for Higher Education in Focus comes from the Penn State Alumni Association, serving alumni and alma mater for 145 years. On the web at alumni.psu.edu. Penn State Bookstore, improving the student experience at Penn State with philanthropic support of student causes throughout the university. On the Hub Lawn or at psu.bncollege.com. The attorneys of McNeese, Wallace & Newark. Your mission, your goal, your lawyers. More at nwn.com. And from viewers like you. Thank you.